The heart beats about 2.5 billion times over the average lifetime, pushing millions of gallons of blood to every part of the body. When the heart stops, essential functions fail. Prioritizing your heart health tonight, on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening, and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Duck, medical information based on science, built on trust. I'm Dr. Andrew Ellsworth, your Prairie Doc host tonight. Thank you for joining us. Tonight's topic is heart health. Joining us in the studio is Dr. Sherry Brooks, and via Zoom is Dr. Drew Messerschmidt. Both are from North Central Heart, a division of Avera Heart Hospital in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Welcome, Dr. Brooks and Dr. Messerschmidt. Dr. Brooks, if you don't mind telling us a little bit about yourself. Thanks for having me. I appreciate being here very much. Um, as you said, I'm Sherry Brooks, cardiologist from North Central Heart now. Originally, I am from a small town in Erie, Michigan, which is uh, you know, quite a bit of distance from here. I grew up there. I went to college at Michigan State University, and then I went to graduate school for about a year and then at Michigan State, and then on to Michigan State University College of Osteopathic Medicine, graduated from that. Then in Lansing, Michigan, I did my um, internship, residency, and fellowship. Oh. So it's a good thing Michigan State isn't playing basketball tonight. <laughs> it's a good thing, or yeah. we, <laughs> But I had a hard time getting you on, maybe. <laughs> yeah, right, that's for sure. And what do you do in your practice? In my practice, I uh, see all sorts of patients. Um, but primarily, I do uh, general cardiology as well as preventive medicine, uh, preventive cardiology, and then I do some invasive, some limited invasive um, cardiology, which is in the form of uh, cardiac catheterizations and uh, implantable loop recorders. Those are the, the big ones that I do, as well as transesophageal echocardiogram. I don't really consider that so much invasive anymore. Um, but uh, that's what I do generally, and I see patients every, just about every day. And of course, the echocardiograms are an ultrasound of the heart, getting an image of how it's pumping and how the valves are. And right. Yep, absolutely. The, the transesophageal echo is one where we put a scope down into uh, the esophagus and we get a better look at the heart in all of its pieces from different angles that we can't see very well from an echo that uh, they do every day on patients, which is called a transthoracic echo, um, generally referred to as an echo or uh, ultrasound. Very good. Well, thank you for joining us. Dr. Messerschmidt, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, of course. I'm also a general cardiologist here at North Central Heart. Uh, focus on general cardiology, prevention, and imaging. I'm from South Dakota originally, actually just right here in Sioux Falls. Grew up in the area, uh, bounced around for training a little bit, um, but did graduate from USD Medical School went to residency out at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, Utah, and fellowship at University of Vermont in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, and after that, wanted to get back home, so took a position here. Awesome, well, thanks for both uh, joining us here, and I think maybe both of your first time on Prairie Doc? It is, it is. Yeah. All right, well, hopefully not the last. Nope, so, glad to be here. Excellent, well, this is a popular episode with everyone always has concerns and questions about their heart. So we appreciate being here to, to answer our viewers' questions. Tonight, we invite you, our audience, to submit or call in with your medical questions about cardiology and heart health. Your name will remain anonymous. Viewers can contact us three ways. Call one 888 376-6225, send an email to ask at prairiedoc.org, or message us on our Prairie Doc Facebook page. We will work to answer as many of your questions as possible during this episode. Sometimes we receive more questions than we can cover, and we apologize if we do not get to your question. To encourage you to ask early, all questions asked in the first 20 minutes will be entered into a drawing for our newest Prairie Doc publication. The winner will be announced at the end of this program. Your, your question will remain, remain anonymous, but please provide contact information when you submit your question. So we have several uh, questions already from email and Facebook, and, and, and here's a, a good one to start out with. Uh, Dr. Brooks, what is the link between cholesterol and heart disease? 
Well, that's a really great question. Thanks for asking. The, the, the link really is cholesterol causes heart disease. That is the placking that builds up inside of your arteries. That's what actually causes the blockages and causes your arteries to become stiff. And then, uh, of course, can become occluded or blocked and cause a heart attack. And so what can we do about it? There's lots of things, but there are four main things that you can really do. One is, you know, always eat right and exercise. Those are two really big ones. Um, know your numbers, know your cholesterol numbers, know your blood pressure numbers, know uh, your family risk in terms of who in your family has had heart attack and what other sorts of uh, illnesses do they suffer from, particularly later in life. And then the last big thing is to not smoke. Definitely. And, and Dr. Messerschmidt, why is it that it seems like people's cholesterol increases as they get older? If it's mostly from diet or genetics, why would it matter if we're getting older? Well, it certainly can uh, be due to changes in our metabolism over time. Um, people tend to be less active as they age, and they also lose skeletal muscle mass as they age. And that skeletal muscle mass is a lot of what uh, sort of burns through the, the food and fuel that we eat, like sugar. So things like diabetes tend to spring up later in life and other metabolic disease as well. High cholesterol is one of those. Certainly. And so when do you recommend someone start considering a cholesterol medication, Drew? That's a very individualized question because Cholesterol is really just one factor that contributes to cardiovascular disease and a host of other risk factors. So depending on things like your family history, comorbid conditions such as diabetes, uh, smoking history like uh, Dr. Brooks Sherry was uh, alluding to, can all play into when somebody would decide that uh, pharmacologic intervention for their cholesterol is necessary. But the, the long story is viewing yourself as a you know, whole individual with all kinds of different risk factors and positives in your health as well, doing what you can from a lifestyle standpoint. And if your risks that you have that are you know, maybe genetic and maybe part lifestyle add up to you being at risk for heart disease, you might want to consider a pharmacologic intervention. Sure. And this, this leads us right into this other question from a Facebook viewer. At my recent physical, my cholesterol was slightly elevated. What is the first step to bring that down? And we've basically covered this, but just to hammer it home, what would you say to them? The, the, first, first, step. Thing, the first step would be to look at what you're eating and, and just make sure that you're making really good choices in terms of really a balanced sort of diet. Um, you can sit with your family doctor and they can talk with you about that or, or a dietitian can be more helpful if you have, uh, you know, a bigger history in your family, particularly of high cholesterol, um, you know, dietitians can be really helpful as well. And then there's all sorts of resources where you can always find them on the internet and so forth. Uh, but that's the biggest thing. And then if you're not exercising, really look at your exercise program. And of course, again, don't smoke. Don't smoke. And, and what about fish oil? Fish oil can be really helpful. Um, you know, it, it doesn't lower your cholesterol, say like a statin would, which is a statin is a medication that we give patients that is a prescription. Fish oil can be a prescription as well. Um, it's a purified fish oil that's a prescription. However, um, and it can lower your triglycerides, can lower your total cholesterol as well. Um, so it is a good supplement to add into your uh, program. Absolutely. This person from email says, both my father and grandfather had a heart attack in their late 50s. How does that family history affect my chances for one? So Drew, you alluded to, we talked about, a little bit about family history, but you know, if, if someone in their family had heart attacks in their, in their 50s, what would you recommend to them? If you have a family history of heart disease, it's probably worth talking to your doctor about even at an earlier age. Um, just like Sherry was saying, know your numbers. So something like a, just a routine cholesterol screen, even for a young person that you know doesn't necessarily intend on, hey, this is going to lead to some sort of uh, medication prescription right now. Um, knowing your numbers is important to knowing your risk going forward. 
The, there are other screening tools as well. And again, that's sort of an individualized thing that you can talk to with your doctor of, is this uh, screening relevant to me at my stage right now with my risk factors? Things like calcium scoring and that sort of thing are ways that you can individualize your risk a little more rather than saying, you know, because a lot of people have heart disease in their family and there are many factors that uh, lead to that outside of just inheritable uh, things like genetics. Uh, lifestyle plays a difference uh, in all of that as well. Absolutely, and that again leads into the next question that came here from email, how does my blood pressure relate to my heart health? So what, what blood pressures are we looking for and, and when should we be concerned, Sherry? So a good blood pressure is 130 over 80 and that follows with diabetics or non-diabetics. That's probably the, you know, that's the goal. Any blood pressure over 140 in any person is gonna be a problem that we're gonna wanna be looking at to get your blood pressure down. So, you know, in my practice, I typically give people, you know, about six months to get, if it's 140 or 150, about six months to get it under control if they wanna try diet and exercise. And then um, usually what I'll have my patients do then is keep track of their blood pressure twice a day so we have a good ambulatory at home blood pressure um, when they're not in a, a, a white coat environment because that can really raise your blood pressure as well, right? In the clinic and hospital. Uh, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I have them take it twice a day and then, you know, send it into the clinic so we can review those and then decide upon a medical therapy for them if it's necessary. Now, just to clarify, you said 130 over 80, granted, trying to keep it under that. So Absolutely. Certainly, one teens and yep. one twenties and seventies and eighties are all yes. all good. But Absolutely. Under that one. Under 130 over 80. Over 80. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Excellent. And so, what are some of the ways we can help our blood pressure? So, diet is absolutely one thing and so limiting your salt intake and if I had to preach on one thing it would be salt intake. Salt is in every single thing that we eat and drink and people don't really realize how much salt we're actually taking in as particularly as an American society. Well doc I don't salt my food. Right but I'm telling you if you eat ramen soup you've probably taken in your entire day's di uh, you know allotment of sodium um, and, and you d might not even know that. And so it's really important to know how to read labels and see how much is per serving and how much is actually in the entire thing. So a lot of people might, you know, again, let's take the ramen soup, for example, they'll eat an entire brick of ramen and think that that's a serving. A serving is actually half of that. And so half of that has about 960 milligrams or somewhere around there of sodium. So if you eat the entire thing, you're gonna get about 1,900 milligrams, give or take a little bit. Oh. And 2,000 is your total for the day. So it really, if you monitor anything, monitor your salt intake and cut the salt back in your diet, you'll also lose weight if you do that. So there's a lot of things that can come just from doing one thing. Absolutely, and we do have a good roll in about salt and sodium in a little bit. So Perfect. that'll be good to hammer that home too. Uh, while we're on, uh, you know, what to do to help make us healthier now when we want to prevent buildup, well now this person's asking about signs of a heart attack and specifically in women and are they different for men? And I'm going to give that one to Drew because it's his turn. Okay, very good. <laughs> yeah, of course, signs of a heart attack were kind of been trained by, you know, media and whatnot to think that it's crushing heart pain that's coming on suddenly taking our breath away and while that might be true it can certainly be much more subtle than that uh, the pattern of pain or pressure from a heart type pain we generally describe as sort of a diffuse dull achy and substernal People will tell you things like radiating to your jaw or down your arm, which certainly can be present, but don't have to be present to mean that it's heart related. One of the things I tell my patients often is that it's not necessarily that we're looking for any special location of the pain or quality of the pain, but the context is very important. And certainly if somebody tells me I'm, you know, after a meal, I'm feeling kind of full there and I take a tons and it goes away. That's much less concerning than someone that says, when I'm mowing my lawn, I used to get through it just fine and now I'm only halfway through, I'm huffing and puffing and my chest feels tight. 
that context of when your heart is working the hardest, you're getting the most symptoms is one of the more important things we look for. Absolutely. Sherry, this person did ask specifically in women, are there some signs in women that are different than for men? So it is. And, you know, a lot of what we read in the textbooks say, you know, crushing substernal chest discomfort can be really, you know, a sign of heart attack. But women may not have that. Women may be fatigued. They may just be feeling very run down. They may have more shortness of breath. They may have back pain or pain between their shoulder blades and not necessarily in their chest, but in their back. <clears throat> that might come on with or without activity. And a lot of times with women, it's not always with activity that their pain comes on. And so <clears throat> we look for different things, as Drew was saying. It's the context of what you're trying to weed out. Um, does this patient really have cardiac discomfort or not? But in women, you have to really put them in a different sort of category because it's not always the chest discomfort that we that we find in them. They may just, just arm pain, they may have just thumb pain. They may just have just jaw discomfort or throat discomfort, or like I said, between your shoulders and your back, feeling more fatigued or short of breath, or just generally not feeling very well or just feeling some kind of way um, that, that isn't normal for them. And it just really has to raise your suspicion, particularly if they have a history in their family. So bottom line is if you don't feel right, get checked out. Absolutely. Cardiovascular stents are important medical devices that come in all shapes and sizes to help move blood. Prairie Doc reporter Sam Schauer shares Ed Hogan's story and how one stent helped change his life after fainting on vacation. Ed Hogan is a Brookings resident who was vacationing in Florida when suddenly he collapsed and couldn't speak clearly. They came over to help me and Joan said something and I talked to her and said, I'm okay, I'm okay. And she said, all I really said was blah, 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 that whatever I said wasn't clear. Dr. J. Michael Bacharach with North Central Heart is Hogan's cardiologist. And he says Hogan had a blockage in his right carotid artery, which helps bring blood to the brain. Interestingly, he's also, he happens to be left-handed. So it is more likely that his speech center of the brain is on the right side, where most of us who are right-handed, um, again, it's not an absolute, but a generalization that most of us are left brain dominant, that because our speech center is what we consider dominant. A stent was soon chosen for Hogan to help open his blocked carotid artery. What they do is they're implanted and they hold a blood vessel open. So if you have a blood vessel that's severely narrowed or perhaps even totally occluded that you open then and the can do that with a balloon, for example, and then the stent would go in place, and the stent then acts like a scaffold or a support. Hogan went under for surgery and was given a specialized carotid stent. Hogan said immediately after surgery, he felt amazing. I felt like a million bucks. I, th I felt like I was 10, 20 years younger. Dr. Bacharach says stents have grown to be very specialized to help open certain veins and arteries inside the body. We've gotten to the point now where they're very specialized. So carotid stents are unique to carotids. Coronary stents are largely unique to coronaries. Peripheral stents are unique to applications in the legs, for example, or uh, uh, arms in some cases. Hogan has been feeling great since his surgery and is glad he received a carotid stent. I got my health back real quick and I could do things faster and, uh, and I could think right again and uh, it just made a great difference. Well, another example of if something happens to get checked out. Uh, this caller asks, I have a mitral valve repair and, has an, and they have an implant device, an annuoplasty ring. Doctors say he will be on warfarin for the rest of his life. Is this the best medicine to prevent strokes? So Dr. Messerschmidt, they've had a mitral valve repair, so they, they uh, need to be anticoagulated, and this person's on warfarin, and they're just wondering if that's the best medicine. I think that question actually probably needs more uh, background from that individual patient. Uh, it, if somebody has something like atrial fibrillation 
which is an arrhythmia that can happen in people with mitral valvular disease that puts those patients at increased risk of stroke. A lot of times we use uh, warfarin in that situation. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, and there's, and there's sometimes they do a valve repair and they're anticoagulated on a blood thinner for a period of time mm -hmm. and then they discontinue mm -hmm. it. Um, and granted, there's newer blood thinners, uh, these anticoagulants now. Um, Sherry, when, when is someone a candidate for, for some of those newer blood thinners, the DOAX? Right. So again, you know, kind of individual questions, but when somebody has a rhythm problem like atrial fibrillation where the top part of the heart is kind of quivering and doesn't have an organized beat, um, those, that, that kind of a rhythm increases your risk for stroke. And so those patients, typically, we look at DOAX for those patients. There are other scenarios and other situations where people might use a DOAC or use something like Eliquis, um, <clears throat> Pradaxa is another one, uh, but, or Xeralto. To be fair, I'm not picking uh, any one particular brand over another, um, but, uh, there are different scenarios in which we would use those things. And again, it would have to depend on what the patient's uh, other comorbidities would be. And, and things to consider cost too. Absolutely. Some of those can be quite expensive. And so that's one reason why warfarin is still very popular. Absolutely. But with warfarin, they need more frequent monitoring of the, of the levels. That's correct. Is there a large difference between bleeding and outcomes between these different types of quote unquote blood thinners. So if you're talking about the difference between uh, like Eliquis or Zeralto, there isn't really a big difference between bleeding um, with those. They, they, the, the DOAX tend to have less bleeding than warfarin, but again, it's different scenarios in which we're looking to actually say that as a qualifier. And to use warfarin is perfectly acceptable, particularly when cost is an, was an issue. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this person says they have right arm pain. Is that anything to be concerned about? Started a few days ago. In a brief answer, Drew, what would you say to them? Well, I'd go back to what we were saying before. Context is certainly important. And just like Sherry was saying, uh, when you talk about cardiac pain we say there's these typical factors or the typical symptoms and atypical symptoms but certainly when you flesh out the numbers two-thirds of women as we were alluding to before present with what we would call atypical pain so it's something that if it's coming up in the right context and it's abnormal for you you should talk to your doctor about it Dr. Brooks, this person asks, is wine good for my heart? <laughs> well, we'd all like to think it is, right? So uh, uh, actually, the studies have come out that a glass of red wine with dinner, and I don't mean like the whole bottle kind of size of glass, but uh, you know, four ounces of wine, red wine with dinner is actually healthy for your heart, as well as a couple pieces of dark chocolate. Um, Again, not a chocolate bar, but a couple, of, <laughs> you know, every day. But uh, a couple of dark, the dark chocolate, not milk chocolate, is actually good for your heart. Yeah, but when does alcohol become a problem for the heart, Drew? Most people with this sort of question reference uh, some of the Mediterranean diet studies where men were allotted up to two drinks a day and females because of their lower body size up to one drink a day. Remember that that doesn't, mean that the drink is dependent on the size of the glass, like one is just your glass, it's, you know, one <laughs> serving, of course. Um, the study that looked at that did show that there's probably no detriment to that, um, up to that level, two servings for males and one serving for females. Um, but again, you have to take into account those are extra calories. If you're somebody that's trying to lose weight, has metabolic sort of problems, that's probably not something that you need in your diet. Beyond that, you're also, um, alcohol has non-cardiac uh, risks in terms of increased cancer risk and that sort of thing. So you have to 
weigh that. Can alcohol be bad for the heart, Sherry? It can be bad for the heart, particularly if you overuse uh, for any length of time, really. It, you can develop something called a alcohol cardiomyopathy where the heart just kind of dilates out and you lose the heart strength um, and you develop heart failure. And that the important thing to note is if you stop drinking completely, it can be reversible, which is probably only, really only one of the reversible cardiomyopathies that we see. Um, however, you don't really want to get into that predicament in the first place. And so overusing alcohol can certainly lead to heart problems. How often do you see that? I see it a lot more than I ever thought I would see it. And particularly um, in the last, since I've moved to South Dakota, I've just seen it a lot more. I think it's just geographical. Uh, in different certain parts of the country, you see more alcohol cardiomyopathies than in other areas of the country. Yeah. But it's certainly not, un it is certainly not unseen. Yeah. Drew, uh, this uh, person wonders how sleep affects their heart health. Yeah, so sleep health is extremely important for your cardiovascular health. In fact, there are some studies out there that link uh, inadequate sleep and interrupted sleep as being uh, a hazard for your heart on the level of cigarette smoking or greater. So I definitely recommend people focus on their sleep try to get that seven to eight hours of sleep and also focus on the quality of your sleep. Frequent interruptions, bright lights from our cell phones, um, and the kind of silent epidemic I think that we're having here in the Midwest, which is sleep apnea, um, is certainly a big player in all of that. Absolutely, it's gotten to the point where anytime I've had a patient that uh, diagnosed atrial fibrillation, the irregular heart rhythm, I give them a sleep study at mm -hmm. some point there, and it's almost always showing that they have sleep apnea. What is the correlation between the two, Sherry? Well, the, the fact is that if you're not sleeping well, uh, your heart just doesn't work the way it's supposed to work. And when you stop breathing at night, which is what happens with sleep apnea, it stresses the heart and it increases your risk of stroke. And if you have atrial fibrillation, you're already at an increased risk for stroke. So you don't need an added risk. But the, the point is, is when you have sleep apnea, you stop breathing at night and your brain and your heart cannot tell the difference between an obstruction where you aren't getting the oxygenated blood to your brain or to your heart, or if you have a blockage that's blocking the oxygenated blood to get to your brain or to your heart. And you have the same consequence, heart attack, stroke, uh, arrhythmia, or you may not wake up from your sleep. I, I the, some of my younger patients that are now getting treatment for sleep apnea, I'm, I'm telling them this might help prevent heart disease down the road, right. you know, before it becomes more of a problem, before they have atrial fibrillation, mm -hmm. because we, we see those correlated. Absolutely. Americans consume more than 3,400 milligrams of sodium per day on average. This is well above the federal recommendation of less than 2,000 300 milligrams of sodium daily as part of a healthy eating pattern. Prairie Doc learns from Avera about how to reduce your sodium intake, which will help lower your blood pressure and improve the health of your heart. Sodium enters our diet in the form of salt, the compound of flavor. But do you know how much sodium you consume in a typical day? Let's take one day for an example. For breakfast, bacon and eggs. A quick snack with that second cup of coffee a sandwich for lunch, and for dinner, grilled chicken and a baked potato. And you can't forget dessert. A pretty healthy looking diet, right? Well, we end up with a total that's more than 4,300 milligrams of sodium, 2,000 milligrams beyond the American Heart Association's recommended daily value. Now you may be thinking, that's just one day, and there's little difference between the actual and recommended amounts, but extrapolate that over a year, that amount can put a lot of unnecessary strain on your cardiovascular system. Too much sodium in a person's day will actually increase your blood pressure, also can increase your risk for heart attack and stroke as well. You retain more fluid with that, and it becomes a hydraulic thing, just like you put too much pressure in your garden hose, it's gonna stretch and tear. A healthy heart is a key factor to a healthy body, so there's added importance to reading the label and knowing what's fueling you. 
Cutting back on that salt shaker is a good start. Trying to choose fresh or frozen fruits and vegetables instead of the canned ones. Cutting back on the processed meats and cured meats. And, and really just watching those processed foods as a whole is, is really a great place to start. It's not easy because salt tastes good and that flavor informs our choices. Snacks like potato chips and crackers are easy to identify, but the sneakiest way that sodium gets in is usually from the things we drink. That diet soda, it might not be as diet friendly as you think. Any sports drinks or electrolyte beverages, you know, Propel, Gatorade, anything along those lines will have usually quite a bit of added sugar and then added sodium as well. So choosing water is actually the best type of fluid that we can be drinking. The message does not have to be salt and sodium are bad, but being aware can lead you to making healthier choices. So make sure to read the label and take all the things, salt included, in moderation. If we really understood what salt does to our bodies and how high of a risk it is for, you know, heart disease and stroke and increases our blood pressure, um, it really is, makes a big impact on our health too. Well, maybe I'm going to have to start looking at the labels a little bit more often, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we've got a bunch of questions here. Uh, this person uh, from Facebook asks, I had a stent a year ago. What activities should I avoid? What would you say to them, Drew? So in terms of like the physical presence of the stent, like metal, you don't need to like uh, not be around magnets or worry about going through the airport or things like that. As far as exercise and whatnot, that's probably more important to talk to your doctor if there was like damage to your heart, what your heart pumping function is, and if you have it residual uh, coronary artery disease or you know moderate blockages that need further investigation before you go back to like full exercise and that sort of thing. Very good. This person says they were diagnosed with an AFib with RVR, so an irregular heart rhythm with a fast heart rate yes. event during a stressful time. Could this be a singular event or what are the possibilities of recurrence, Sherry? It can be a singular event. However, once you have AFib, the chances of you developing it again Depending upon your age and your other comorbidities, it can be as upward as 50% within a year. So, you know, it's really just worth knowing what your risk factors are and what precipitated this and try to avoid that same sort of scenario again. And then, of course, it depends on what your risk is actually compared with the atrial fibrillation to know if you need to be anticoagulated, even if you've only had one event. So there's a lot of things to consider, not just that it was just one singular event. Sure. This person from Facebook says, I had an electrocardiogram, so an EKG a few days after having chest pains, but it was normal. Do electrocardiograms need to be done right away, Drew? Does the time period matter? If you're looking for things like heart attacks and trying to see what your symptoms mean from an EKG, then yes, it generally has to be done at the time that the symptoms are going on. EKGs, or these electrocardiograms is the full name, can show some signs of people having had a heart attack previously, like scar on the heart. But if you're really having symptoms and trying to figure out what's causing those symptoms with the EKG, it needs to be done in the short term while that's going on. Uh, along those lines and symptoms of a heart attack, how can I tell the difference between GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, and a heart attack symptom? What would you tell them, Sherry? I would tell them not to try to figure it out themselves and actually have your physician and you sit down and talk about your symptoms and then maybe do some testing if they feel it's indicated at the time, but don't try to figure it out yourself because oftentimes patients think, oh, it's just GERD and it's not my heart and they turns out that they have a big heart attack. Or they, you know, conversely, the same thing can happen the other way as well. And over long term, you can have damage to your esophagus because you have untreated, um, you know, esophageal reflux. 
So I would say sit down with your physician and talk about your symptoms and don't try to figure it out yourself. Great. You don't need to do that. Great, great response there. Um, this uh, person is asking, what are the best forms of exercise that can help with a healthier heart? Uh, Drew, what would you say to that? For the vast majority of my patients, I recommend just starting with walking. And a good goal is about 150 minutes of somewhat brisk walking per week. I make that even simpler for people and say try to shoot for half an hour or so a day. Sherry, the, absolutely. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No worries. I was just going to put in my little extra plug that I, I very push. I push exercise a lot, and I say that there is really no ceiling to the benefit of exercise. People that are able to do more and more, you know, in a safe manner and build themselves up, see more and more benefit. So when I say a half an hour a day is a good goal, that doesn't mean that doing more and living a more active lifestyle just in general isn't going to do you more good. Right, and I would say, you know, to add to that, um, when I talk to patients about exercise, sometimes they're very intimidated by half an hour because they haven't done exercise before. And so I tell them, look it, just walk 10 minutes or 15 minutes in one direction. Don't worry about how fast it is or how slow it is. Just walk 10 or 15 minutes in one direction and turn around and go home. And don't think about the time because that will be a 20 or a 30 minute exercise that you've just gotten started. And each time that you do that, you'll go farther and you'll recognize that you're going farther and faster. And the, the time and the amount of exercise you do will build on itself independently. And so, especially for those patients who haven't exercised before, um, absolutely to say what Drew was saying is that it is absolutely beneficial and there's no limit to how much you can do or how beneficial it is, but to get them started, that's where I, try to focus. And I like to break it up too, 150 minutes, well, gee whiz, that's two and a half hours. Where am mm -hmm. I gonna find two and a half hours? But mm -hmm. once again, you break it up. You can get a 10 minute walk in after lunch every day. There's an hour by the end of the week. Another 10 minutes at the end of the day, mm -hmm. there's another hour. And then if you can get another half hour in on the weekend, you've got your two and a half hours. Absolutely, so absolutely. It's doable. Uh, this person has a PVC. And, and, and they say where their heartbeat is irregular. What are the causes and how serious is this? Well, what is a PVC? What does that term mean, Drew? PVC stands for premature ventricular contraction. Our hearts have four chambers and the pumping chambers of the heart are called the ventricles. A PVC is electrical activity that generates from the pumping chambers of the heart. Now, almost everybody has PVCs, and a lot of people feel them throughout their life. It can feel like a little skip beat or a thump bump. The symptom we call that is like a palpitation. We do know that people with heart disease tend to have more PVCs than people without heart disease. But like I said, just about everybody will have PVCs if we have them wear like a cardiac monitor. Where that line is for this is abnormal and, or this doesn't necessarily mean anything is very individual. A lot of people will come in with PVCs and get cardiac testing and everything will be totally normal with it. And they might still have a higher number overall of PVCs than somebody where it was like a warning sign of a, a cardiac problem. PVCs also vary a lot in how symptomatic they are. Some people feel them really severely and some people don't actually feel them at all, even though they're having PVCs. So not to, you know, completely, you know, just be disclaimering on every question here, but it's really an individual thing and you should talk to your doctor about it. Absolutely. And 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 that's true for any of these, but uh, and so but hopefully we're raising some awareness of, of some of these things things for people. How long, uh, how, how does having diabetes relate to heart health? What should I be doing as someone with diabetes? So again, know your numbers. Try to get your 
your sugar under good control. Your hemoglobin A1C, you want to, you know, have that under seven. And in that, you'll have to work with your primary care uh, or perhaps even an endocrinologist about to, to try to really get that controlled. But controlling your diabetes is paramount in taking really good care of your heart health. The, the more out of control your diabetes is, the more it will affect things like blood pressure, things like your cholesterol buildup in your arteries. And the cholesterol buildup on your arteries, as we talked about at the beginning of this program, is what causes heart disease. And so, you know, the more control you have over your diabetes, the better your, your outcome or your, health, your heart health outcome will be. And exercise is a really important factor in controlling your diabetes, as well as dietary and medications. But talk to your primary care physician about that. And going back to the cholesterol, this person from Facebook asked, when you get put on high cholesterol pills and you exercise, how long will you have to take the pill? Can you get off the pills, Drew? Yes, I would say it's possible to get off the pills, but what I tell my patients when they ask me that question and they say, how long do I need to take this pill? I tell them, you need to take it for as long as you want to receive the benefit of being on the pill. And if that means that we're bridging you as you you know, lose weight, improve your diet, control all of these other risk factors, and then as a sum, your global risk goes down and we decide that you don't need the pharmacotherapy for the cholesterol anymore, then you can come off the pill. If at the end of that, your numbers for any variety of reasons are still putting you at higher risk, well, then you may decide with your physician that you stay on it. So, yeah. you know, there's a lot of people that can't take statins for cholesterol because of the muscle aches. Mm -hmm. what, what do you say to them, Sherry? There are other alternatives in terms of treating your cholesterol now. Um, there are other, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals that we can use that are not necessarily statins. And there are also um, new things on the horizon as well. But one of the things that we do use is injectable medication. And, and that actually has been very promising. It really lowers the cholesterol quite nicely without the benefits of, or with, sorry, without the side effects of the cholesterol medication sometimes having, which is the muscle aches, which is, you know, that's a problem when people really suffer from that and they have heart disease. Absolutely. And, you know, and I've had some where if they took it every other day, that absolutely. helped. Have you seen that? Absolutely. We absolutely do see that. And, you know, some benefit from an every other day or, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday sort of schedule is better than not taking anything at all. And so they're still going to get some benefit from doing that and get your numbers down. And maybe that's all you need. But again, work with your family doctor or your cardiologist or endocrinologist to get those numbers under optimal control. Drew, this person asks, why isn't aspirin just as good as warfarin or Eliquis? What's the difference between aspirin and the other anticoagulant medications? Yeah, so aspirin is an antiplatelet agent, which is you know kind of technical. It works in a different way, but it certainly thins your blood to a lesser degree than things like warfarin or Eliquis. The blood thinners all have kind of different indications and uses, and in even in conditions like atrial fibrillation, depending on stroke risk, your doctor may recommend something milder like aspirin or something that's more of a like a full anticoagulation strength like warfarin or Eliquis. Very good. A cardiac rehab program is often done, well, when is a cardiac rehab program done, Sherry? And, and what do you, when do you recommend it and how often do you recommend it? This question is basically asked. So the, the most often people run into cardiac rehab after they've had a heart attack or some sort of cardiac event. And absolutely we recommend it then. But you know, being healthy and doing some sort of exercise is always encouraged re before you have an event, certainly. But cardiac rehab, you know, most of the time specifically refers to when you've had some sort of cardiac event. Most of the time it's a heart attack of some sort, some degree. Um, <clears throat> exercise program that is monitored and uh, tailored to you as an individual. 
We had uh, a, a small study here in Brookings looking at our patients that started ca cardiac rehab, mm -hmm. and it was clear that those that followed through and did as many sessions and kept going with the sessions were much less likely to have another cardiac event that mm -hmm. landed them in the hospital Absolutely. than those that only showed up for a session or two and then quit coming. Right. And so it just, it, 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 it really brought it home for me that, boy, we, you got to keep it up. Right, absolutely. And I think some of that is a real focus and a dedication to getting your heart healthy after you've had an event. And you know, there's sometimes there are things, there are factors that patients can't come or there are barriers why they can't get to cardiac rehab, but there's a, you know, a home program that could be tailored to you. So certainly we do know that exercise after an event absolutely helps to stave off a second event or a third event. Absolutely. In a final minute here, Drew, uh, what are some l lasting uh, words of advice here, That final words of advice you have for our, our viewers at home? Yeah, I would say that when you're in your doctor's office and they're talking to you about your numbers, like your blood pressure and your cholesterol, and talking to you about what you can do about those, we often fall into really focusing on the pharmacology, but I really want to stress to the patients that pharmacology without lifestyle intervention and without living a heart healthy life is not going to be the thing that prevents heart disease. Okay, the exercise and the diet and not smoking, controlling the blood glucose, those things are the most important medicine in, in cardiovascular prevention. Always been true, always will be. Absolutely. Thank, thank you both for joining us on this Thanks show for tonight. having us. The winner of our prize tonight is Todd. Thank you, Todd, for asking a question during the first 20 minutes of the show. A gift will be sent to you. We'll be back after this. Looking for a source of trusted health information? Grab a copy of your local newspaper or read online the newest Prairie Doc Perspective, a weekly health and medical column. Head to prairiedoc.org to access all archived columns today. Well, Doc, the patient was telling me, I get winded so easily now. I can hardly go to the mailbox without stopping to catch my breath. It did not used to be that way. Do you think something is wrong? Many of us have experienced shortness of breath. After a period of inactivity, such as winter or a busy month, when we decide to exercise again, it may be easier to feel winded. That experience can be due to deconditioning, feeling out of shape. A good remedy for that is a gradual increase in exercise, helping us to regain our strength and endurance. Sometimes we get short of breath for other reasons. A recent infection can be a common cause, giving us a bad cough and leaving us winded for a while. There are several other lung causes like asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, including emphysema and chronic bronchitis, which can leave us short of breath. However, the feeling of shortness of breath does not necessarily mean there is a problem with the lungs. Shortness of breath can be a symptom of heart disease. A partial or total blockage of an artery in the heart may give someone chest pain, but sometimes shortness of breath could be one of the only symptoms. One can feel winded from heart failure when the heart is not pumping as well. As the heart has trouble keeping up, a person can get short of breath from the buildup of fluid, which may cause swelling of the legs and sometimes buildup of fluid in the lungs. Or, perhaps the shortness of breath is from anemia. If someone is anemic, the hemoglobin level in their blood is low, which reduces the body's ability to carry oxygen throughout the body. Anemia can have a variety of causes, such as blood loss, low iron or other nutritional deficiencies, or problems with the production of blood cells. Blood loss can be caused from anything from heavy periods to a stomach ulcer. Everything that can result in anemia can result in shortness of breath. My patient with shortness of breath from walking to the mailbox came in to see me and we did several tests, including a chest x-ray, blood tests, and an EKG. 
Ultimately, we did a stress test, and after an angiogram and stent in the heart, he feels much better and is walking a mile or two nearly every day. It is important to tell your healthcare provider if you are feeling shortness of breath. While it could be due to anything from your heart, your lungs, being out of shape, or even anxiety, please do not ignore your body if you are feeling winded. A big thank you to Dr. Brooks and Dr. Messerschmidt for volunteering their time to help us to answer your questions about cardiology. If you would like to see and hear more episodes of this program, please like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok, or visit us at prairiedoc.org. Look for Prairie Doc Perspectives in your local newspaper and online, and listen to us live every Wednesday morning at 9.30 on KBRK Brookings. And be sure to look for the podcast of this program, Prairie Doc On Call, wherever podcasts can be found. From all of us here at On Call with Prairie Doc, thanks for joining us for another episode of Health Information Based on Science, Built on Trust. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. are painful, inflammatory, autoimmune, and degenerative diseases that are more than just aches and pains. They affect all age groups and vary in severity. Advances in rheumatic disease, next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. My name is Jennifer May. I'm a rheumatologist in Rapid City, South Dakota. I got involved maybe around 2005. That's when I first started practicing in Rapid City and my former partner introduced me to Rick and actually got me on the on-call show. I think we did a story on gout. Um, and that was my first introduction to Rick and the Prairie Doc sort of concept. And it's a great resource for information. We have a lot of people that live in remote places. They maybe don't have a lot of good access. And we know that there's a lot of misinformation in terms of health information that you can get online. And having a reliable source for people to go to with people they recognize that they might know on the programming, I think is really important. Well, I think having anything that isn't tied to an agenda is really important. And so having access to information that you can refer your patient to that you know they're not going to get fees or get their data sold is really important. I think if people want high quality programming from local people, local experts that supports your community, supporting Prairie Doc is the way to go. For more information or to donate, please go to www.prairiedoc.org or mail your donation to Post Office Box 752, Brookings, South Dakota 57006. Thank you for your support. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by... Out here, the day starts early and ends late. You don't love this land because it's easy. You love it because it's home. At Avera, we're built for rural health care. We're bringing quality, innovation, and advanced technology to your vibrant communities. Care when and where you need it. That's how Avera moves health forward. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, Brookings Health System, South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Ophthalmology Limited, 
Avera Medical Group Brookings, Avera Heart Hospital, First Bank and Trust, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Monument Health, Dakota Dermatology, Vance Thompson Vision, Black Hills Medical Society, Brookings Madison Flandreau District Medical Society, Pier District Medical Society, Sioux Falls District Medical Society, Yankton District Medical Society, Orthopedic Institute, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, South Dakota American College of Physicians, Cool Beans Coffee, Lake Ponset Sailing Academy, and Swiftel Communications.